Bismillah. So the Meccan period, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ received revelation when he was approximately 40 years old. It was a life of 40 years of greatness. Even those who may not be his friends after prophethood, they all confirmed and all affirmed and all testified that he is the greatest, that he is the most truthful, he is the most trustworthy. Fantastic. At the age of 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the command. What was the first command Allah ever told your role model? What was the first command Allah ever revealed to the one you will give up your life for? What was that first command? It was the command to recite and learn the Quran. Iqra' bismi rabbik. And this command is not just to the Prophet of Allah, but it's to you and I. Every single believer, you are obligated. It's not optional to learn about Islam, to learn about your religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet ﷺ, Iqra, read, learn, recite, so on and so forth. May Allah protect us. Brothers and sisters, one more point about this to emphasize and to truly tell you from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for coming tonight. Jazakumullah khaira. May Allah honor you. May Allah grant you happiness. And to all those who are watching as well. So, Jazakumullah khaira. But brothers, takbir for the online crowd. Alhamdulillah. Out of everything in the world, everything in the world, there's only one thing in the Quran or the one time in the Quran that Allah told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask more of. There's only one time in the Quran that Allah told the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, ask more of this. Was it money? No. Was it status? No. Was it fame? No. What was it? وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي ilma. The only time it was Allah telling the Prophet, O oh Prophet of Allah, ask me more of knowledge. Ask me more of Knowledge, may Allah increase our knowledge, Amir Rabbil Alameen. Taib, when the command of learning came, what was the second major command that kind of shifted things around? What was it? Command to spread the message of Islam. Now you learned, then you preach. So we learn once again from the Prophet ﷺ. You cannot preach without knowledge. You cannot talk without being educated. So the Prophet ﷺ learned and now he's preaching. So one more thing here. Now that we learn, we have to preach. But brother, wallahi zakallah khair. I'm not really a good speaker and stuff like that. Who said that spreading Islam is only through lectures? Who said that spreading Islam is only through writing articles? No, it's much, much bigger than that. The Prophet wasallam addressed all the believers. He says, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ Ah, yeah. The Prophet ﷺ says, convey about me, even if it was one verse, that's all what you know, so be it, share it. Don't belittle your knowledge. Try to grow, and whatever you have, you teach within your capacity. So it's an obligation upon every one of us here to represent Islam to our best of ability. May Allah eat it on all of you. Common sense and revelation both come to the conclusion that when you learn the religion of Allah and you preach the truth, who pops up? Enemies. That's the way the world works until the day of judgment. So when the Prophet preached, Allah commanded him to persevere the verbal abuse that he faced. They made fun of him. They made fun of his family. They made fun of the fact that he has no boys and her bo his boys died at a young age. Look how filthy that level of abuse was. Then they went and they also were physically persecuting the Prophet ﷺ and the believers. And Allah continued to say what? Isbir, be patient. Don't be physical. No. Respond with kindness. This stage is a stage of invitation of da'wah with gentleness. That's how it is. When it got so bad, so, so, so bad, that the persecution is now going to the level of wanting to kill you, the command comes, it's time to go. It's time to leave Mecca, that's it. That's an extreme case of situation that now you have to emigrate, leave Mecca. This land of Mecca is no longer fertile. 
you have to go away and find another group to preach to, then eventually you can come back to Mecca. May Allah protect us and grant us wisdom. Amir Rabbil Alameen. And we too have to emigrate. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What just happened? Darwash ar We too have to emigrate. What do you mean we have to emigrate? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look, brother, just one second. When we, we do have verbal abuse, but it's not that bad. We do have some persecution, but it's not that bad for us to emigrate. But no, we still are obligated to emigrate. What's your proof? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The real muhajir, al-muhajir, is the one who emigrates away from sin. Man hajara man Allahu anhu. Allahu Akbar. That's the real immigrant. Is the one who migrates away from sinning. May Allah make us of that group. And the reward of migrating with the Prophet ﷺ, what did he teach us? Those who migrate with the Prophet, يَهْدِمُ ma قَبْلَ What does that mean? It erases all the sins in the past. Allahu Akbar. And we too, when we emigrate from the Haram, Allah forgives our sins. You see how we learn from the life of the Prophet ﷺ? So learn the deen, forward it to people, persevere to your best of ability within wisdom, and emigrate from sinning and disrespecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us. The Prophet told you and told me, pray for security. That's why he said, Allah al -afiyah. And may Allah protect us to a way that we don't need to physically leave and emigrate. May Allah make it easy. Amir Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet sallallahu heads now from Mecca to Medina. Fantastic. The believers are waiting on the outskirts of Medina. From the morning till noon, when is the Prophet coming? When is the Prophet coming? But at noon, it becomes so hot. They waited so long, the Prophet didn't show up. Alayhi salatu wasalam, they go back to their homes. Until one day, on a Monday, as they waited till noon, he did not show up, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They went back to their homes. And after some time, a Yahudi, a Jewish man, went to an elevated place to look for something of his own. And while he's looking for it, he peeked, he looked, and he spotted who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet, this was happening at Quba, which at the time was the outskirts of Medina. So that Yahudi said, Ya ma'ashar al-Arab, O oh, Arab, the man you're waiting for has come. How did he know him? Wallahi, the Yahud at that time, they knew the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the way they knew their own kids. Kama ya'rifuna, continue, abna'ahum. Would you mess around with your children? Are you my daughter? Are you my son? No one does that. That's how much you know them. They knew the Prophet sallallahu the way they know their own children. People were rejoiced. People, some of them left to the outskirts of Medina. They greeted the Prophet ﷺ. They shook his hand. Eventually, when they came to know him, and Rasul ﷺ stayed in Quba, did not yet enter into the actual city of Medina yet. The Prophet ﷺ stayed in Quba for how long? Some estimate about 14 days. Settled there. People in Medina getting ready. The Prophet is coming, inshallah. In these 14 days, what will the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Build a masjid. And it's called Masjid Quba, the first masjid ever built by the Muslims by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 14 days, build a masjid? 14 days, yes. It's a simply or a simple, humble building, but it graduates the greatest generation. May Allah grant us wisdom, Amir Rabbil Alameen. So Rasulullah Sallam now. The people of Medina are aware the actual city, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is coming. The men and the women are standing on the roof of their homes. The children are flooding the streets. The Abyssinians are holding the spears where they want to perform and entertain the Prophet and make a show of appreciation and welcoming to the Prophet And even some of the Jewish scholars, they came, such as Abdullah ibn Salam, they're watching, they're watching until they spot the Prophet walking. Alayhi salatu wasalam. May Allah allow you to see the Prophet in Jannah. So they go, they said, He's here. Qadima Rasulullah. Qadima Rasulullah. The Prophet is here. The Prophet came. People are celebrating. People are happy. Then the Prophet walked in and the people surrounded the Prophet. They said, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah. 
Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah. Three times, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah. Before they want to kill him in Mecca, but here they cannot wait to see him alayhi salatu wasalam. And he is happy, rejoiced, all that welcoming. Brothers and sisters, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the midst of this is about to give his first speech. Allahu Akbar. What will it be like? What will the words be? May Allah grant us wisdom, Amir Rabbil Alameen. The one who tells us this narration was someone at that time was a Jewish scholar in an authentic narration. He said, the first thing I heard Muhammad sallallahu saying, and look what he said, and I looked at his face, and wallahi, that's not the face of a liar. He too recognized Muhammad is the prophet of Allah as they saw in their books. So the first thing the prophet sallallahu said, Ayyuha nas, O people. So everybody, O people. Imagine, all people are ears. What's going on hearing this? What's up? Right? You want to hear? Ayyuha nas, O people. He says, spread greetings. Afshu salam. I want this to be a habit for this entire community that we spread greetings. Can we do that, inshallah? Inshallah, one of the things the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us is a true believer says salam, greets the ones whom they know and the ones whom they do not know. So you promise me, inshallah, you do a promise with Allah that when we have our break or so, inshallah, you will say salam to the ones that you've never known before. For the sunnah of the Prophet sallam, inshallah, five bi'idni Allah ta'ala minimum and you go from there. I want to be very honest with you. When you come on the ground and you want to apply this, it's not as easy as you may think. Because it might be pretty weird. Especially if you're not used to it. I'll be very honest with you. And I struggle personally. And I try to apply it as I'm putting the content together. Not as easy as I thought. I thought just salam, move on. It's not. So many times you see someone for two, three years. Three years you see him. You don't know their name. You never said salam to them. Imagine after tonight, they say, salam. He's like, what do you want? <laughs> I've seen you for three years. Right? And I tried. There was one guy. May Allah forgive us. So I, I, I went and I just, like, I was just nervous. I was like, salam. And like, I, don't, I just want to move on. So he turned around because I went to an angle. So this is how it was. So he was sitting here. I said salam to him. Then I went from behind him. I walked. Then I looked back. When he looked me in the eyes, like what was that, right? Which is horrible from my end. May Allah forgive us, because that was not a habit that we should establish with some people that we may not know. So please follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and greet those whom you know and those whom you do not know. Afshu salam. All right. What's number two? Feed the people. Feed the people, especially the needy. Look at the words the Prophet is saying. Very wise words. Feed the people. This does not only specific to the needy, but even being hospitable. When the guests come over, put some food. There's something about food. I don't know what is it, but it just works. Wallahi, it works. It softens the hearts. Unbelievable. I remember one time we brought a dozen donuts. May Allah forgive us unhealthy stuff, but inshallah will change, inshallah. We're learning. Okay, I remember we got a box of donuts to work, and some guy came to me, big shot, makes easy six figures. Well, so what's the occasion? I said, no occasion. I didn't say the hadith, obviously, right? So I said, no occasion, just, you know, donuts and stuff. So he grabbed the donuts, even though he can buy a hundred thousand dozens, but subhanAllah, there's something about that food for free especially <laughs> right so he grabs it and we establish a relationship I would have loved to continue the story and say I got promoted and I got no but that didn't happen right <laughs> but the promotion with Allah that's the focus right promotion with the sight of Allah so feed the people then the Prophet وسلم, he continued he says and stay connected with family family is very important the Prophet وسلم, is saying this and pay attention there are people here in the family, some are Muslim, some are not. So he's teaching them, when I come here, I'm not separating family members. You are, have blood relations, it will be like that forever. This is family, you always stick with your family. Some people had relatives who are Yahud and they were Muslims. Family stays family. Nothing, nothing cuts the family. May Allah protect us, Amir Rabbil Alameen. Number four, وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ And pray at night when people are asleep. 
praying at night when people are asleep. Brother, I just need a little bit of clarification on this one. I, I don't get it. The prayer at night is voluntary. It starts from Isha to Fajr. That's the night. Obviously, when the Prophet says that, the understanding is that you do all five daily prayers. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. May Allah make us steadfast. And the Prophet said, the best salah ever, شوف, the best salah ever after the five daily prayers is a prayer that you perform after Isha and before Fajr. So try your best to do that. How many rak'ah, how do we do this? You can go from as little as one rak'ah. Have you ever heard that before? One rak'ah. So you do your thing, you do your prostration, you don't go up back for the second. No, you stay there and you do the tashahud and you end your salah as little as one, as many as 11 or some narrations 13. Fair enough? And when you go there and you make this be the last part of your day, may Allah allow us to establish that, say ameen. And the Prophet ﷺ really stuck to it. If he ever heard the word witir salah, that's the one we're referring to. Any, any time throughout the night. The Prophet ﷺ, you want this? You want this to encourage, inshallah, encourage all of us? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is authentic in Sahih Muslim. There's different narrations I do understand. Allah descends in a way that befits His Majesty after the first third of the night. After the first third of the night. Allah descends, na'am. And Allah says, who here wants something so I can fulfill it for them? Allahu Akbar. He's coming to ask you, what do you want? Tell me and I will give it to you. Then He says, who here wants to be forgiven and I will forgive them? Allah says that, Allah says that, Allah continues to say that until Fajr. So let's utilize that time in the left Brother, brother, one last question before you continue. What is it? How do I know when is the one third of the night or second third? How? One of the opinions tells you, you go from Maghrib prayer. So what time is Maghrib here? Half the audience is exposed. You don't know where Maghrib is. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. About 5, let's say about 5.30, right? Maghrib is 5.30. Roughly speaking, roughly, Aisha, or sorry, Fajr is 6.30. So how many hours? 13. 13 hours. These 13 hours, to know with a one-third, two-thirds, simple. 13 divided by 3. So very rough estimate. If I do it 12 divided by 3, that's 4 hours. So this means the hadith of Allah descending in a way that befits His Majesty and all these offers are given and provided is about 4 hours or a half or so from Maghrib. So that means what time? After 10.30 p.m. Roughly, today speaking, roughly. So let's utilize that inshallah. Khalas? And as you pray, remember me inshallah. Right? Whenever you pray for me, the angel says, and may you get the same thing as well. So do business. Your dua may not be accepted, the angels will. So you pray for your brother and Allah will grant it to you, inshallah. Sounds good? Alright brother, did the Prophet conclude? Did he say there's a reward? He says, whoever does these four, you enter paradise with peace. May Allah make you all the people of paradise. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters, the speech is done. The people are so anxious to have the Prophet stay over their house. Ya Rasulullah, in my house. I, I, my house. Who said it first? I said it first, right? The back and forth. And they're fighting. Ya Rasulullah, stay in my place. Stay in my place. So eventually, where will the Prophet wasallam stay? He said, in authentic narration, I will stay at Bani Najjar, who is who? The relatives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He stayed with his extended relatives. You know what the Prophet just did? He walked the talk. He just what? Walked the talk. The people had to be impressed by that. He just said, stick with family. And he stayed over his family. He says, Ukrimu. Ukrimuhum bidhalik. I will honor their request. Allahu Akbar. And indeed it was an honor. Brothers and sisters, if you were there, would you be ready to host the Prophet Yes. Inshallah. Well, they're going to rip all the posters of Ronaldo around the whole house. May Allah forgive us and protect us. May Rabbil Alameen. Huh? Are you going to start changing your clothes? You get, get your phone like, where's the Qibla, bro? I don't never pray for like three years. Where's the Qibla? Where's the Qibla? 
right? And then your mom is here like, Mama, jazakillahu khaira, and all that stuff. You change? Huh? So why not live a day or two and just have this imagination? What if the Prophet ﷺ walks in? And brothers and sisters, this was the advice of the Prophet. What was it? He said, always think of death. Are you ready to die in the state that you're in? May Allah forgive us and protect us. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. So this wonderful man, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, his wife, Umm Ayyub al-Ansariya, they host the Prophet Wasallam, and it was a great, great, wonderful experience. Brothers and sisters, as sweet as things may sound, the believers were facing hardships in Medina. Severe hardships. Why? No, things are not as easy as you think they are. In Medina, people had physical health problems. People had social problems, had emotional struggles and financial struggles. The Sahaba? Yes, the Sahaba. Brothers and sisters, there was a weather and climate changes, which many people suffered many sicknesses. It was so bad, so bad, that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq thought that he will die. Aisha suffered. May Allah be pleased by her. Bilal suffered. It was so bad that physical pain contributed to the emotional pain. They became homesick and they are missing Mecca. Bilal was so much in pain. He prayed against the people of Mecca. Why? For they were the reason he was pushed away. That's how much they miss Mecca. Not just that, the financial struggles. Many Muslims, and you have to never forget this point ever, especially when you read the life of the believers at that time. Many people in Mecca were very wealthy. So for them to be able to proceed, brothers and sisters, for them to be able to proceed and reach the Prophet ﷺ, they had to give up their homes, they had to give up some of their clothes, and I will not exaggerate if I say, some people have taken absolutely nothing with them but the clothes that they have on. No, no, no. And there's another example of a companion who even left with no clothes on until he ran into one of his relatives in Mecca and then was covered. His, his family saw him like that, no clothes. And then they ripped a cloth that is so rough, wrapped one around his waist and one over his shoulders. And he was known as Abdullah Dhul Bijadain. That's how much they had to let go to reach the Prophet ﷺ. So keep that in your mind. Financial struggles. Imagine he had all that money. We have people, refugees here. May Allah lift the hardships from them that they were doing very well in their countries and now they're struggling. May Allah make it easy for all of us. How will the Prophet ﷺ address these issues? There's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that was done. I will share three highlights with you, inshallah. May Allah bless our gathering. These solutions are for you and I as well. It's not just for them back in the day, but it's for all the time and any day. May Allah protect us. Ameen. Number one, assign friends. The Prophet ﷺ makes it very clear. Friendship is not something to take lightly. Friends have a major effect in your life and afterlife. He comes and we have narrations about friends, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, المرء على دين خليله. You are upon the religion of your friend, meaning your friend is so influential, they will not just influence your cuisine and what do you eat, will not just influence what you wear and what you say, but they can go as far as influencing your religious identity. It's just a matter of time. May Allah safeguard us and protect us. Friends, 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 I said it before, I say it again. Whenever we get phone calls about parents, and wallahi, some of them crying over the phone, and they say, my son, my daughter, I don't know what happened, they're struggling. People have different styles. But at the time when I used to address these issues, my first question to them is, have you noticed a change in their friends? And Allah is my witness, 9 out of 10 said yes. It was a change in friends. And the parents sometimes said, I didn't really know it was a big deal, such and such. So as parents, and soon to be, whatever your case may be, you need to know who are the companions of the people that you love, your children first and foremost. May Allah protect us. And this is happening not to children, but also adults. adults. 
So you cannot say, Wallah, I'm different, Baba. No, because that little child you have, he looks at you. You tell him, watch your friends, and you are not walking the talk like the Prophet of Allah. Yes or no? You go tell, tell him something, and you do otherwise. Go, go read the Quran. I want to read you to read the Quran. And he sees that child, their father never reads Quran. How do you expect your child to be? The children follow what you do more than what you say. The children follow what we do more than what we say. And never forget that. Friends, 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 may Allah grant you all righteous companionship. You want one example? of the Rahman bin Auf. Where is he from? From the immigrants, from the people that left Mecca. The Prophet assigns suitable friendship, companionship, compatibility. Abdul Rahman bin Auf is assigned with who? The people of Sira. Sa'ad ibn Rabi' al-Ansari. May Allah grant you to be able to see them in Jannah. Sa'ad. Sa'ad is from the supporters, from the original residents of Medina. Sa'ad told Abdul Rahman, can we have brotherhood like that, inshallah? Can we? Ready? Sa'ad tells Abdul Rahman, I am one of the richest people of Medina. Abdul Rahman is an immigrant. Abdul Rahman was a multimillionaire. Abdul Rahman left everything. Abdul Rahman has nothing, pretty much. So Sa'ad tells him, Ya Abdul Rahman, I will split everything in half. Allahu Akbar with you. If he had two houses, I will give you a house all for you. If I had two rides, I'll give you my one ride and I'll st stay with one. If I had 100,000, I'll give you 50,000 and I will take 50,000. Allahu Akbar. Brothers and sisters, this level of brotherhood, Allah praised in the Quran. Iman. So Allah says, they believed as a result, they loved. And that's the love for the sake of Allah. There's no love for the sake of Allah without Iman. You see that? I love you for the sake of Allah. Where's the Iman Mafi? Then that's not love for the sake of Allah. That's for dunya, for other stuff, for uh, blood relationships, just natural love, you can call it, whatever you call it. But love for the sake of Allah is based on Iman. And that's the strongest bond of love will ever exist on earth. It's that love that makes someone love you for what you believe. Perhaps love them more than their own blood brothers. Yes or no? Brothers and sisters, not too long ago, just to kind of... Because I feel sometimes when people say, love for the sake of Allah, we may not really understand. Love for the sake of Allah is love from first sight. Okay, how does it mean? You know this person is very practicing. You know this person tries to please Allah. That's what it looks like to you. So automatically you love them. I want to understand better. Okay. I know some people may not appreciate examples of this sort of local time, but it really helps. One team here in the West, one team said, I, and the, the, the athlete, the superstar, he said on a selfie video, thanking the fans that watch that team. So he says, I want to congratulate everyone who bleeds gold and purple. What? I congratulate everyone who bleeds gold and purple. What team is that? May Allah forgive you. I mean, okay. So this means this person, if he, look at the level of love. If you cut my hand, you know what I bleed? Not red. Purple and gold. That's the love for the sake of the Lakers. <laughs> right? So this means if this player sees someone wearing Purple and gold to the game, automatically they love them, yes? And the moment they see the rivals, automatically dislike Fisabi Lakers. You see that? Automatic. Allah is the better example, our deen is the better example. You love a person that bleeds, La ilaha illallah. May Allah make us people like that. So now when they say that, oh, extremism. We have a barbaric speaker here in Dearborn, Michigan, telling people that if they bleed, they bleed, la ilaha illallah, really. But bleed purple and gold, Allahu Akbar. Very nice, very, you know, united type of team, right? This is the greatest team in the world, the team of la ilaha illallah. May Allah make us always victorious, say I mean. And wallahi, you will never lose if Allah is watching over us. So that is the type of friendship, and Allah appreciated that. And Allah shows that these people, especially the Medina residents, Amazing. Allah says the people, the Medina residents, when they received the refugees and immigrants from Mecca, 
They did not feel any pain in their heart when they saw the things being given to the refugees. Oh, our resources. No, our resources are your resources. Allahu Akbar. And they shared that with them. Not just that, they prefer them over themselves. May Allah allow us to have such brotherhood. Amir Rabbil Alameen. But brother, brother, before you go to the second point, what did Abdul Rahman say? Okay, give me half. La. Abdul Rahman bin Auf is a dignified, honorable person. I'm not saying he said, yes, give me half. That's not, he's not dignified. No. But he said, may Allah bless your family. May Allah bless your wealth. If you want to help me, I want one thing from you. What is it? Dullani ala suq. Show me where's the right spot to start my business. I'm, I'm a businessman. The people of Mecca are businessmen. The people of Medina are more into farming. Fair, fair enough? So al Sa'd al Rabi' helps Abdul Rahman bin Auf. This is where you start your business, brothers and sisters. They worked, they worked. Abdul Rahman worked one day. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, after a few days, several days, weeks, Allah knows best. He's walking, and the Prophet sees a mark on the neck of Abdul Rahman. A yellow mark. What does that mean? At that time, this was a like special cologne or so, which is placed when someone gets married. So the Prophet said, Abdul Rahman, he's like, Tazawashti Ya Rasulullah, I got married. Allahu Akbar. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told him, do like a party, like a walima. May Allah grant us wisdom and perfection in terms of our deen as much as possible. Amir Rabbil Alameen. So with this being said, by the way, you have to appreciate something on the side. You see that? Abdul Rahman, uh, Abdul Rahman, may Allah be pleased by him, did not tell the Prophet he's getting married. The Prophet did not take it personal. You see that? How did you, why did you not invite me for the wedding? I've known you for... Right? No. You got married, yes. And they moved on. So may Allah make our life simple. For some reason, you guys really like that point. May Allah protect you. Especially that we're in the wedding hall. It's very suitable. Alhamdulillah. Alright, so don't take it personal. Now, the second thing the Prophet ﷺ will do is what? Build a masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ is going to go ahead and start building the, the masjid in Medina. And who will build it? Who will build it? The companions? No. Not just them, but a wonderful, phenomenal, great 54-year-old man will participate. Who is it? Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. He will go all in or just like cut the ribbon or just like one brick? No, all in. And what was the material of the building? It was four materials. Number one, the walls were made out of mud. So a mixture of water and sand. The pillars were the trunks of the palm trees. Number three, the roof were the leaves of the palm trees. The ground were sands and stones. How long did it take to finish the masjid? Roughly 12 days. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us wisdom. Amir Rabbil Alameen. And when the Sahaba, they see the Prophet of Allah building, how do you think they feel towards him? How humble is that greatest leader that ever walked on earth? That is very effective. That is why when you, inshallah, read through the books of hadith and you read the life of the Prophet, there's a statement the believers say very often. You know what do they say? Bi abi anta wa ummi. Meaning, I'll sacrifice my mom and dad for you. Wow, that's a, that's a big statement. Yes. What do we say today sometimes? I will take a bullet for you, right? Maybe exaggeration, but the, the point is that so much love, correct? When they said that to him, you know why? Because he walked the talk. Never did he tell them to do something except that he was d doing it to his best of ability. Never did he tell them, be good to your spouses except that he was the greatest husband in Medina. Yes or no? Never did he tell people donate except that he was the biggest donor in terms of the quality and sometimes quantity. Never did he tell the people, Pray to Allah at night, except that he prayed until her feet, his feet became swollen. So when the people see him saying, do this, and then he does it at his best of ability, that cannot help but move all the hearts, the truthful hearts, may Allah protect us. And this, these things add a lot of pressure on community leaders, on parents, on every individual in society. May Allah protect us from hypocrisy. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. 
Building the masjid, very important. The masjid is where they, where they learn the Quran. The masjid is where they understand Islam. And the Prophet emphasized and added more pressure and singled out the brothers with attending the salawat as much as you can. Emphasis that, is, that will shock some of you of how important it is for it's singled out. The brother of Tabullah is difficult. Rasulullah emphasized it. You pray your five daily prayers in the masjid because you're a man. And this is the Prophet, he singled out to you. You have to. Rasulullah was very firm. We have to what? Listen and obey. No complaints. Why is the pressure not? Alhamdulillah for whatever the Prophet and Allah assigned us. Say, say Alhamdulillah. Our Rasulullah gives you a hadith of encouragement, all that stuff, and a hadith of warning. The Prophet said, whoever goes to the masjid Fajr and Isha, Allah will grant them light on the day of judgment when it's very dark. And he also said the opposite. The ones who struggle to pray Fajr and Isha is a sign of hypocrisy. May Allah protect us, Mirabal Alameen. So take it to your best of ability. May Allah grant us wisdom. Um, some may say about Fajr and Isha in terms of not necessarily attending the masjid, but even at home, bare minimum. But the emphasis is to go to the masjid. May Allah allow us to be strong. And out of the entire West that I'm aware of, all the West that people say in the map, I don't know. Allahu Alam, maybe there is. I don't know of a city that has many masajid so close to one another the way we have it here, correct? So say Alhamdulillah. May Allah protect us, Mirabal Alameen. Number three, the Prophet وسلم, makes dua to Allah. Very important lesson, brothers and sisters. You can do all the actions you want in the world. You can build the most beautiful, grandest masjid. Teach all the people the entire Quran and you assign friends, but you need to believe in your heart that all what you've done is just the means and in a way meaningless unless Allah helps you out. And while you do it in your heart, you know Allah is capable of doing all things. Okay, if Allah is capable of doing all things, then why should we work really hard? Because that's the prerequisite to get Allah's help. The means are the prerequisite to get Allah's help and look what he says to address everything we said physical emotional social and financial ready he says oh Allah oh Allah habib ilayna al madina ka hubbina makka aw ashad oh Allah make us the believers love madina the way we loved makka and even more where the hearts are under whose control? Allah. After the dua, what happened? The believers loved Medina more than Mecca. How? You don't ask how when it's Allah. You just believe that Allah can change the hearts. Allahu Akbar. So you know what I learned from the Prophet? Seerah. We get lessons after lesson. I learn, inshallah, if I ever have to move to a different house, I'm so sad, the city and things like that. Yes, I will try to have new friends. Yes, I will go to a nearby masjid. But I also need to pray to Allah. Ya Allah, make my heart accept that location which I had to move to. You see that? You learn the steps, the proper steps. May Allah protect us. Now dua number two. And the Prophet wasallam said, addressing the financial struggles. Oh Allah, bless the measuring quantities. What does that mean? The pound of apples for example a pound of apples if it's enough for five people oh allah bless that pound and make it enough for much more than five people 10 15 20 whatever allah wills and if it, something was a kilogram of for example bread if it's enough for a 10 people oh allah bless that amount did that happen yes medina is blessed by the will of allah dua very important number three ya allah wa lana Ya Allah, there are diseases, people are about to die. Ya Allah, cure the area. Allah cured there or no? Wallahi, He did from that disease. You, if you were to bring all the doctors in the world, they would not do what Allah did to Medina. That disease was completely pushed away out of Medina to a remote area, no one is there, and the people felt better. Abu Bakr lived, Aisha lived, Bilal lived, and no one passed away. Bifadlillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see how the dua, you see that strategy? It's a way of life. When we teach the seerah, 
not just wallahi entertainment or just a family hangout. That's great, alhamdulillah. But it's a way of life. May Allah allow us to adapt to it. Say ameen. And adopt it, ameen rabbil alameen. And one more thing before we go to the last part. What is it? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, throughout his life, he's having a dream. In this dream, Jibreel, the angel, comes and represents someone to him. It was a lady. So the Prophet woke up from the dream. Another night he had a dream, saw the same girl in that dream, saying, this is your wife. Third time, some other day, Allah knows when he has a dream, he sees the same girl, the same woman, third time. This is your wife. So the Prophet ﷺ, he woke up. He said, "In kana min indi Allah." This is authentic. He said, "If this is revelation from Allah, then it will happen." So who is that girl? Who is that girl? That girl is one of the greatest women, one of the top and the elite that walked on earth. One of the top. She was a woman who was on the same mission as the Prophet ﷺ. She was a woman who helped the Prophet escape from Mecca. Yes, she helped put the food and the drink for him to escape from Mecca to Medina. She was a woman from one of the most noble families in all of Mecca. Allah made the dream a reality. This wonderful lady is none other than Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr. The one whom Allah revealed through revelation, she got married. May Allah be pleased with her. They got married. Brother, where is the Prophet's house? He built a small room, a few rooms right next to the masjid. That's how he now built his house. After all of what we said, to the most part, he built his house. You know what real estate agents, they teach you? They teach you something very important. What do they say? What's the most important thing in selling a house? Wow, what is it? I'm not sure. Is Brother Jimmy here? Is Brother Jim, Jimmy here? Okay. Any real estate? Real estate. What do they tell you? They repeat it three times. You know what the real estate agent tells you? Location, location, location. Right? See, now you all memorize it. That's how you buy a house. Location, location, location. The Prophet shows his house based on the message's location. So next time, inshallah. You become a big shot, bi'ibnillah. You want to move out of Dearborn because Dearborn is so tight for you. Allahumma barik, mashaAllah. When you choose the location, be sure a masjid is next to you. And choose it wisely. And if you're such a big shot, then build a masjid next to you, inshaAllah. <laughs> Sounds good? That, may Allah grant, grant us wisdom and around righteous friends and assist us with building a masjid, Amir Rabbil Alameen. And with the ending of this session, and I know I'm ending a little bit short, bi'ibnillah, but this slide is what we'll end with, bi'ibnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after a note after it, a sentence. 14 years later from the prophethood, 14 years after revelation, about two years or so from immigration. So the prophet lived in Mecca how long? 13 years. He became a prophet at the age of? 40. He moved out of Mecca at the age of 53, 13 years. About a year or two after that, approximately, Allah revealed a revelation, a whole new command. Anytime in Mecca, it was persevere. Don't be physical. Don't fight back. They oppressed you. Just continue preaching. But now, Things has changed. Allah revealed in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Udhina lillatheena yuqataluna bi annahum zulimu, wa inna Allah ala nasrihim laqadeer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, permission has been given for you to fight back. When the people moved to Medina, the believers, the enemy, Mecca is waging war against the believers. There are people in Medina may want to hurt the Prophet ﷺ. There are nearby tribes that want to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. We persevere doing nothing about the oppression and the warnings we're receiving of murder and assassination. Allah changed it. Allah says, now you are given permission. But Allah was very specific. Did you see that? In this command, at this stage, Allah said, only fight the ones who oppressed you. You cannot go fight other people. 
ولا تعتدوا وقاتلوا الذين يقاتلونكم fight the ones who fight you fantastic with that being said the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم starts sending his scouts whoever tried to harm him or whoever he was oppressed by especially Meccans especially Quraysh he would try to attack their trade caravans for they were filled with wealth that was robbed of them when they were in Mecca. In addition, they were people that waged war against the Prophet ﷺ. So everybody is aware of that. So many attempts were made now that they're using this verse, but they never were able to capture a caravan. They were never able to go to the enemy and somehow be able to damage their economic situation, to be able to overcome the oppression they received. Until one day, there was a caravan it's very special. This was a massive one. What's that caravan? We'll go into details, inshallah, after the break.